Welcome to Lama Surya Das's Awakening Now podcast. We are very pleased to share with you Lama's unique illumination of the awakened awareness teachings. If you are interested in supporting Lama Surya Das's podcast, please go to beherenownetwork.com slash Surya Das. Chanting the Gate Mantra on page, which is the heart mantra of the Heart of Wisdom Sutra, the Mahaprajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra, the Heart Sutra, the Heart the Quintessence, Distilled Essence of Wisdom Scripture. On page 20, we're not going to study that now, but the mantra is at the bottom. And it says, just to, it's said, it's taught that just to chant this encompasses all the virtues and benefits and blessings of the whole sutra. And this, of course, is just a one-page version of the 1,000 verses of the great long wisdom scripture, the, Ma the Prajnaparamita Sutra of Mahayana Buddhism. So I like this kind of powerful pill supplement mantra. You just chant this mantra and you get all the benefit and blessings. And it's said that wherever it's chanted that these remarkable enlightening, liberating, edifying, transformative blessings and benefits will be realized and accomplished by whoever practices it and all connected to them in widening concentric circles of interconnectivity, including all the beings and the local animals and insects and birds and bless the waters and the natural elements and all those who abide in them. So it's a very vast and beautiful practice and, and thought to hold, intention to hold, to include all in our big heart prayers and practice our bodhicitta, the noble heart of the bodhisattva, the engine of enlightenment. If the bodhisattva is like a great vehicle, Mahayana means universal vehicle or great vehicle or universal path or great conveyance of deliverance, great vehicle in short. If Mahayana is a great vehicle or an ark for all beings, then the bodhicitta is its engine. The bodhisattva is like the vehicle. The bodhicitta is his or her heart, its engine. And cultivating it and practicing and living the bodhicitta is the gas, it's the fuel, carbon-free, green fuel, of course, that fuels that engine that is the heart of the bodhisattva vehicle of universal deliverance. So I love this chant in this practice. If you like it too, carry on. Feel free. The Dharma is free. No one owns it. It belongs to those who love it and want it and need it, as Buddha himself taught or implied. <clears throat> no one has a corner on the market of truth. The Dharma belongs to everyone, especially those who want it and need it and practice it. And the Dharma is a very big word beyond isms like Buddhism and schisms. Thus, Dharma is a word that predates Buddhism, Hinduism used it, and in general it just means um, living spirituality or transformative spirituality. So we could, by extension, call many forms of enlightened living or spiritual life Dharma. When we're practicing this Dzogchen non-meditation or view meditation in action, the ground path and fruit of the great perfection, the view like the sky, infinite, spacious, all accommodating, nothing to do but enjoy the view. And from that, naturally, the meditation of non-meditation, of getting used to it, that great state of allowing radical acceptance, just being open and lucid, empty, open and lucid. Clear light is one way of calling it, but that sounds a little too optical or visual. The inner luminosity includes all the six senses and beyond. The view, the meditation, and naturally the activity. We'll get more to that at the end of the week when we talk about integrating Dharma into daily life at home, and etc. That's the ground 
we need a, a chart that's going to go across from left to right. That's the ground, the basis, the view is the ground, the basis of this direct path or three steps in one path of view, meditation, and action. How non-dual Mahamudra and Dzogchen are always explained. The ground, the f basis, the view, and the path, the practice, beyond the difference between practice and ordinary activities, beyond the duality or the dichotomies that we make between the sacred and the mundane, the pure and the impure, and so forth. Samsara and nirvana, heaven and earth, and all the other dichotomies and polarities. Remembering what the third Zen ancestor, we used to call it patriarch, just so you know who I'm talking about, of Zen of China, call, said in his great Trust in the Heart Mind Sutra, his long poem, Trust in the Heart Mind. He says, the, way is, the great way is not difficult for those who have few preferences. When heaven and her, earth are set apart even one inch, everything is very divided. Make the slightest, let me restate that, make the slightest distinction, however, and everything is as far apart as heaven and earth. So this unitary view, unified view that we're talking about here in the non-dual Dzogchen practice, not the general Buddhist path and Mahayana teachings, progressive development, character development, attitude transformation, morality, concentration, meditation, insight, purification, and wisdom. But in this swooping now from above with the bigger picture, the view, this direct access, non-dual tradition, practice of Tregchud, of seeing through. The ground is the view and the meditation is the path of non-meditation, of getting used to leaving it as it is, seeing as it is first is the view and leaving it as it is is the meditation, non-meditation. Meditation writ large in life, integratable with everything. No need to close your eyes, put your plugs in, and a mind plug, numb your bodily sensations, and then try to find something quietly inside. That's not what we're doing here. And the view, ground path and the fruit is the activity, the natural Buddha activity of the great perfection. In life, the ten bodhisattva, virtues in action and so on, the ground path and fruit, the view meditation and action. So this is the view is the ground, is the glimpse, is the recognition. Sometimes if you if you if you have the mixed fortune of reading t Tibetan Buddhist books in translation, I said mixed, not miss fortune. Then it often says introduction to the nature of mind. That's not necessarily the best translation of this first point. It could just as well be called recognition of your true nature, recognition of your divine nature, rec realizing who and what you are recognizing. Not just introduction as if somebody else has to show you. So this first one is the recognition or introduction to our true nature, our Buddhaness, our Buddha nature, the inner divine, whatever you call it, the clear light, the Dharmakaya. That's the glimpse, that's the basis, that's the view on which we can talk about seeing it as it is, like recognizing awareness as distinct from just thinking. Awareness of thoughts is meditation. Mindfulness of thoughts and feelings and perceptions, sounds and so on, is meditation. Just hearing and seeing is not meditation. So discerning or recognizing awareness itself, awareness alone, awareness the bigger flow, the totality. How can we know anything if we're not aware of it? So awareness is the palette upon which the colors of all the states of consciousness are found. Color it. The one taste, the unity, the, 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 uh, the unified nature, the homogeneity, homogeneity, let's say, of awareness. Rigpa, pure presence, high, uh, rarefied subject, mystical subject. It's not a thing. 
In other words, it's not a thing, a subject and object. It's not an object. It's not a thing. It's no thing. Yet it's everything. Mepa, chikpu. It's the only thing. Chowa, all pervasive, ubiquitous, everywhere available. And Lundra, spontaneously present or manifesting the four points of introduction to the nature of the ultimate. We call it Rigpa in Tibetan. The Buddha mind. It's not a thing to be found like, Dick, Jane, see, Rigpa, run. <laughs> look, Rigpa, look, what color? It's got spots and dots and bubbles and colors and rainbows on it. No, but not unrelated to that. That's a, like a tiny wavelet in the great flow of it. In the great flow of it, the great flow. Just seeing and recognizing and freeing and releasing, you see. It's related. It's not that, not this. Oh, see Spot run. No, don't look at the other cats. See that dog, whatever. Spot was a dog or a cat, I don't know. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Maybe they don't have, <laughs> maybe they don't have books anymore like that. For you younger generations under 60. It's not a thing, it's everything, it's all pervasive everywhere, always accessible, and spontaneously manifest or accomplishing or perfecting itself. Like everything is poetry, not just poetry, everything is music, not just the music that comes um, on a record. <laughs> Am I dating myself, John? <laughs> I, I'm from Brooklyn. We, we have records again there. Wax. <clears throat> so first is the view, the glimpse. That's the ground of this pathless path, this signless, wishless, aimless, goalless, structureless, yet very precise and like clear and luminous, lucid path, practice path. The view and the meditation inseparable, this pathless path like the sky, view like the sky, this glimpse of seeing things as they are, including ourselves, recognizing awareness, Rikpa, the projector, not just the projections. Thus, the fearless master from, of our lineage, the great Jigme Lingpa, Longchenpa's main disciple, the great Jigme Lingpa, whose treasure teachings is the Longchen Nintig, the heart essence of the infinite vast perfection, Jigme Lingpa, said, the dogs chase the bones when thrown. The lion jumps right on the thrower. You want bones? Jump on the thrower. You'll get more than just bones. <laughs> so not just chasing the projections and the perceptions. But jump on the thrower. Back to who's doing what around here. The projector, not just the projections on the silver screen of emptiness that we get so caught up in and enthralled by and forget that we're even at the movies. So tracing back the radiance, as it were, the radiance on the silver screen, looking at that beam and look, oh, look, it's coming from that little window back there with a the little minimum wage slave college student running a projector or whatever they have today, probably an iPhone, shooting out the whole movie out of their digitized Dick Tracy watch iPhone. <clears throat> so the glimpse, the recognition of our true nature, is the beginning of the true path in Mahmudra and Dzogchen in the non-dual tradition. And from that is the meditation of non-meditation, seeing it as it is and then getting used to it, allowing, leaving it as it is. Maturation, maturing the view, there's nothing to do, there's nowhere to go and no one to get there. And from that comes the action, the glimpse, the maturation and stabilization from the maturation, from exercising Rigpa, from the glimpse where we recognize Rigpa, we recognize our Buddha-ness, our Buddha nature, our Buddha mind, we're introduced to our true self. How should we put it? Where we find our inner divinity, then we, 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 we find love for ourselves, we accept ourselves, we find ourselves acceptable and lovable totally, even just for a glimpse of a moment, then we, at least we know there's a there there. It's possible. Then comes maturation, is exercising that muscle. First, somebody introduced us to, um, the, we have a muscle. What we have to do is use it to firm it up. 
So in exercising Rigpa, that's a Dzogchen practice, a non Stabilization is the third. That is the, the fruit, the path, where everything is it. The bodhisattva virtues naturally unfold as the inner sun of wisdom rises, let's say, in the heart, let's say, its rays naturally shine out, reach out, rays reach out. Not neurotically do good or needing to be needed, codependence. Rays naturally warmth, energy moves, radiates, re outreach, in reach and outreach. The rays naturally reach out in the form of compassion and action. Altruism, generosity, helpfulness, and all the other bodhisattva virtues. The enlightened life, the saintly life, the beautiful life. Not just legislated following the precepts and rules, which are more in the relative behavioral sphere. But now we're talking about the natural outflow of the beautiful rays of the sun, inner sun of wisdom and its lo natural loving, compassionate, awesome, nonviolent, helpful, generous, beautiful, balanced, healing rays. Warm, illumining rays. Nurturing rays. So from the glimpse, maturing it, which is really the path, it's really the whole thing here, and then naturally comes the love and compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, forgiveness, and everything else that we cultivate in the, our more ordinary supportive Mahayana type or Christian, Jewish, whatever, humanistic, atheist practices. Just being a good person. Doesn't need to be legislated. It's all in the rigpa. If you're selfless, you naturally don't act selfishly. We can understand that. There's a lot of talk about no self or shunyata, emptiness, but unselfishness. Let's remember that. That's very important. So from that kind of selfless, empty, naked awareness, and there's no self in other, naturally you treat others beautifully. So that's the view meditation in action. More practically, the glimpse that I'm introducing here, introducing to the true nature of the Buddha mind or heart mind within ourselves, the awareness with a capital A, the Rigpa, the primordial presence, as it's also translated. Namkai Norbu translates Rigpa presence with a capital P, rather than awareness, which seems so anthropomorphic, anthropocentric, human. It's not just human, it's beyond, it includes all beings. As Buddhism teaches, all beings endowed with the luminous Buddha nature, the Buddha seed, the bodhicitta, the Buddhaness. All beings, not just human beings, leading to all kinds of implications like vegetarianism, kindness to animals, the environment, and so forth. Not to mention non discrimination and non-discriminating against other creeds or genders or colors and so forth. All beings equal in the Buddha nature, in the mandala of the great perfection. It's all center. There's no one closer or further to God, I mean Buddha, in this scheme. It's in everyone. It's in the last place people look inside oneself and each other. So in Tibetan, for you Tibetan scholars, some of you old students, it's nice to see you here again, even in, you know, be looking so old. We have our new grandfather, Chad, here, and his, you know, Freud, in case you don't recognize him, his 40-year-old Freudian disguise. <laughs> Chad go, molts every few years, and he goes through these phases of, uh, maybe you've noticed, but somehow, goddamn, he always looks just like me. I mean, this is what he told me. I didn't, this is not about me. Every few years, he looks like the different me of my different stages. Am I exaggerating, Chad? You always tell me that. I just take a look at him. Look at that face. <laughs> okay, nice to see you, Chad. <laughs> um, in Tibetan, Mutra, direct introduction. Seldzok, perfecting the skill or the ability, meaning of rigpa, of awareness, and tempetop, 
stabilizing the ground. So that every, because you're stable in the ground, the fundamental, then the path is everywhere. You can't de fall from it. This is a very interesting little triad of pith instruction from the indomitable Mipam Rinpoche. Named Mipam because he was indomitable in debate, which was a very important part of uh, Asian religion and Tibetan Buddhism over the centuries. So from the direct introduction or recognition, Nutra, recognizing your dharmakayaness, your Buddha nature, your, your true self, what words can we use? Then practicing, exercising Rigpa, perfecting the skill, the, perfecting all the potential and prowess of Rigpa, and then stabilizing it. So what are you stabilizing? You're stabilizing the ground so that where you can never stray. It's the groundless ground from which one can never fall or stray. It's not a narrow path. That's why it's so vast. Ground path and fruit of the great perfection. That's why everything is it. Everything is part of it. There's nothing outside of it. It's a marvelous gospel or good news from ancient times. It's not just some new fabricated thing that LSD made up on LSD in Sir, Big Sur. In a hot tub at Big Sur, I mean. I've said that so many times that I just like the shorthand. It's just like, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the important part is that this is the traditional textual scriptures of the Dzogchen tradition, tried and true over many, many centuries. Of course, I'm not saying that's why you should believe it. I'm just telling you it's not something I made up this morning to come up with some new material. And you won't find this in books, this kind of chart. This is a nice redaction or, or boiled down um, explanation here. And there are other triads we could go on to with this scheme that I can't remember at the moment about the three kayas. The view is the Dharma kaya, the meditation is the Samboga kaya, the energy, the vision, the awareness level. And the action is embodiment, is the Nirmana kaya, tulku, life, embodiment, life, tulku. We incarnate lamas, us, people, animals, life. So this is a very interesting way of seeing the whole dharma in, in three in one, inseparable. And simultaneous, not later after you die or many lifetimes of schlepping to enlightenment. That it's all here and now in the very simple Panacean Rigpa practice. It's a marvelous thing, but... Don't believe it just because I say it, or Buddha said it, or it's in the Dzogchen text. It still remains to be confirmed for oneself if you feel interested, and it's incumbent on you to confirm it for yourself. Belief only gets one so far. And even belief, there's different levels of it. And I'm mentioning this for a couple of reasons. One is we hear a lot about belief in general talk in the religion and spiritual world. And then another is that in Buddhism, you know, we might say that faith isn't that important, but Marvin's going to talk about faith on Friday in the Dharma talk. And in Tibetan Buddhism, if you look at Tibetan Buddhists in general, you might, especially Tibetans, you might see a lot of faith and belief and, faith and faithfulness and even the benefits of it, not just the un understandable foreignness of some of it. The faith that has kept them going through so many troubles and travails in exile as refugees and other things. In, in Tibetan Buddhism, we te it's taught that there's three kinds of faith, blind faith, but that's not all. Then there's also like avid or interested faith where you actually, you feel, you smell, you taste something, you like get interested and you start to have more faith like in that direction. You're actually on the scent. And then lucid faith, which is more like conviction where you actually realize something. You actually not just smell it, but taste it, chew it, and digest it, and grok it, and make it part of yourself, and get the nutritional benefits. Then who can take that away from you when it's part of you? No one. Again, back to no one owns the Dharma. It belongs to those who love it and practice it and themselves. So, from blind faith, develop, you know, like childish faith in Santa, beautiful in its time and way and stage to avid or interested faith, getting on the scent, 
sense, you know, getting connected, feeling, seeing, experiencing something. Two, lucid faith or unshakable faith, which is not just dogmatism or, or a kind of a rigidity, but really conviction that nobody can take away. Like nobody can take away from you the love of your mother or whatever they tell you. I mean, just been talking in general. They didn't give it to you, and they can't take it away. So this is a scheme to support our practice and why we practice the way we do, which might seem like we're not doing anything. We're actually doing a lot. We're undoing a lot of habits also of looking for things outside, of seeking elsewhere, of relying on things that are unreliable, not just material things outside, or appearances, or reputation, or wealth, or power, but even inside, relying on things that the, the unconscious and unenlightened habit of relying on unreliable things inside, like um, pleasure or momentary um, happiness, you know, emotions that go up and down, um, or to states of mind even more deeper, like concentration or bliss or, uh, you know, like even more subtle states of mind are still unreliable because they're just temporary states of mind. We're more interested in the united state of mind than in any particular state of the billions. There's a word for that, yuganada, zanjuk in, in Sanskrit and Tibetan, united state of mind. It's a, used in Malat and Mahamudra. It's symbolized by the Buddha who sits like this, uniting means and wisdom, compa- wisdom and compassion, or method. Yuganada, inseparability of action and inaction, inseparability of means and wisdom, or inseparability of emptiness and love, in wisdom and love, inseparability, the unified state, or integrated, psychologists might call it today, totally integral holistically complete. So there's a lot more we could talk about. I also, I'm a little um, careful, aware of the time. I want to open the floor to questions. I also don't want to continually spur intellectual uh, thinking in this opportunity to do something a little different here this week than philosophy or read uh, and think about Buddhism and read, think about Dzogchen. We try and practice something and um, realize, you know, exercise, Rigpa exercise, not just study Buddhism or study Dzogchen or talk about it. I'm trying to transmit something, not just teach about it. So it takes two to tango. Yes, Bill. Lama. I actually put in the envelope downstairs a letter to you that you addressed much of in today's Dharma session. But um, it's really kind of spooky because um, what spurred this... I didn't get that letter yet, just to spook you. No, I know you. (laughs) Because I know you're a rational kind of chap. Perhaps. Um, But last night I participated in a chant practice, and sitting in the seat we actually read this Heart Sutra snippet. The whole page? That whole page. Wow. And last night lying in bed, I pondered that form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. Yeah, that could get you going. It did. (laughs) And as I drifted off to sleep, I imagined evaporating into shinyata. Mm -hmm. But alas, I woke up this morning. Alas, one always does. (laughs) in 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 the same form. But, but I was left with a very interesting thought that's actually burning inside of me. And you actually answered it when you said today that just the wanting there to be heaven takes it away from you. Um, and I, I want to elaborate on that. I, I think through the Dharma that you're um, transmitting, which you are, It's clear to me that this path of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha not only elevates yourself, but everything on on all the realms at the same time. I actually actually get that. 
But the question I have, the thought I have, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, it seems that you know, as, as the wheel goes around, it's just gonna take too many turns. There's just not enough time. We're not gonna be on this planet long enough to get there as a, as a whole. That's sort of the frightening thought. So while people like us can sit here and recognize the idea paradise, nirvana to people, because in, unless we're all there, none of us are there. You know, unless the, the very I parent. get it. Everybody gets it. Um, so why do because, we still do it? Because we're dumbing it down for everybody. There are so many different definitions of that. It's a limitless thing. So um, but, but unless it's, expla you know, not everybody thinks about it in the same way, square or total. Of course. Or anywhere in between. So to talk is to dumb down already. Since, to use your very pungent words, rather than to say, oh, I wouldn't call it dumbing down. How about... To use your very pungent words and your very like cogent uh, point, um, words already is a dumbing down into concepts and limited. And you know what? When you, one says heaven, it's just a placeholder for everybody's interpretation and definition. And heaven in Buddhism or Hinduism might be very different interpreted in general than heaven in the Western Abrahamic religions. And um, the word God is such a big word, like truth, love, or Buddha, enlightenment. This is just a placeholder. So just to even talk about it is already a dumbing down. And yet, communication seems to be needed and required. So that's why. Yeah, I, I guess that is why. It's just... And, and, you know, everybody hears what they hear. Buddha himself... Uh, you're a little new here at the Buddhist game, although you're quite with it, so I'll just give you the straight poop. This is the poop, the good shit. Buddha himself said, according in the Zen scriptures anyway, Buddha said, I never said a word. Everybody heard what they needed to hear. So let's make it a little broader. God never, you know, created anything, everybody uh, is uh, co-creator. I mean, this is a big interpretation, but I, I stand by it. No humans, no God. Who would talk or know about God if there were no humans to talk or know about? It? I'm leaving out the animals for the moment, just talking English, see what I'm saying? It takes two to tango, ancient Buddhist saying. We need duality. Otherwise, what can be said? So, I hope that's helpful in answering your question. Stay with, stay with what you know and what you're doing. You're, you're on a great course and you're a quick study, no problem. And don't worry about what's going on out there. At least for now, you'll have enough to worry about when you leave Saturday. You go back to your busy life and profession and family and, you know, community and politics and life. This is an opportunity to do something a little different. And then those other things, you'll have a lot more clear in perspective or decision making, you know, when you develop more in this, like when the inner sun rises a little more, everything becomes a lot clearer. You have your own miner's light wherever you go. That's the idea. And you raise the specter of time, you know. Time is very relative. So, of course, there's not enough time for everybody. You know, every nincompoop that we know and in our family, not to mention the whole world, including the, the politically incorrect retards and dummies and, you know, and cripples and, you know, the, the, and the you know, people different than us also to get it. They never will. There's not enough time. That's why the Bodhisattva sees, you know, holds the view, the unity of vision, like as if with the third eye, singular vision of emptiness and wholeness, the, the oneness, while discriminating in the duality of diversity. He sees the one and the many. Recognize the emptiness of duality while dealing with right lane and left lane and red green versus green, red light, sorry, versus green light. They're very different. They're not the same in the relative sphere. It's important to remember that.
So more to the point, that's why the Bodhisattva practices the sixth Bodhisattva virtue, Prajnaparamita wisdom, not just dualistic, helping others as if there are others to be helped. That sees the subjective, unreal nature, dreamlike nature of everything, and works to have a better dream, not a nightmare for everybody, and practices being there while getting there every step of the way, not waiting, because it, there's not enough time. It will never happen in that way of thinking. That way of thinking leads to the burnout of the usual activist, because there's never enough to go around. There's always more suffering. It leads to the burnout of the ordinary-minded activist, however well-intentioned or effective. But the Bodhisattva is drawing from an infinite well and not waiting for that. That's a more deeper and complete answer to your question. It, there's never enough time, there will never be, for all beings to you know, reach enlightenment in the square way that the mind reads at those words. If, if nothing else, Lama, I now understand why the Dharma is there for everybody. Because there's no price tag you could apply to it. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, question, just sort of, when we're uh, chanting, if, if we get really into it, yeah. uh, is interpretive dance out of the question? No. Okay. Sometimes we do that. I just, I just didn't get around to it yet. When we're doing Tara or Gate yeah. Mant, you know, we start banging and playing and jamming. No, awesome. definitely. Awesome. It, because it is interpretive already, dance, yeah. everything. So, yes. Big. I, I just didn't want to spend the time on that because I'm trying to um, present some material here yeah. that you might not find in my books or other places when you leave. Awesome. But yes. Okay. Um, also, um, shit I've happens. Had, yeah. Uh, also, a, a good American expression of the Dharma, if you haven't uh, encountered it already, is a children's cartoon called Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, uh, which, in I never which, heard of that. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's a, actually like a very beautiful and subtle expression of the Dharma. And the, the main character is from a country that is obviously uh, representative of Tibet. So, yeah. I'm looking for Judy Ricci, my uh, cartoon collaborator. I will. I will. Are you familiar with that avatar, The Last Airbender? No. But I will be. Sounds good. <laughs> yep. And now millions of, of American children have watched it. So, yeah. It's a cartoon on TV? Yeah, it's on Nickelodeon. Cool. Thank you. Well, it's nice to see you here, young man. What's your name? Uh, it's interesting you should mention that because during the meditation, there were some children looking in the window. There were some adults supervising. I don't know what the whole story is. I'm just telling you, like, the facts as I saw them. There was, like, some tall people behind some short people. And short pe <laughs> the short people all had their little noses and big eyes pressed to the window. And it was really, it was all I could do. I was so laughing to myself, inside at myself. It was all I could do to keep sitting there and, like, not go, you know, do something. <laughs> like... I don't know, what word should I use? Normal or fun, just spontaneous, natural, you know? <laughs> just... <laughs> they were probably visiting Garrison or the kids of the, the, the staff here, who knows? Um, who has the mic? Yes, over there, hi. Hi. Um, <coughs> couple Tim, com Tim, is it? Yeah, Tim. A couple comments and then a question. So I've been hearing, hearing everybody's questions and then hearing my own thousands of questions in my mind, and they all seem to revolve around like the dual duality, basically. Like, are we victims of karma or are we responsible? Should we try to save the world or can you? You know, or there's been a lot of them, you know? So it seems like the middle way is the answer to every question, you know? Like, it's the middle way. It's a good touchstone. I like it. Yeah. It, it really may not totally be the answer to every question, but it's a great touchstone. No, it really does. I mean, I, every question seems to be about trying to balance the opposites. You know, every single question seems to be that. So I'm like, all right, well, then it's just the middle way. But then that seems like, man, I'm really fucked. Because, like, how is your mind ever going to balance out all of these crazy variables? And there's just so much happening. So is the idea that, like, once you have the view and you stabilize it, like, the middle way just sort of happens? Your mind's you? never going to balance it out. This is 
the spiritual project is not about the mind with small m. So the problem is um, what you're saying, you know, you said all of the questions seem to be the either or, or yeah. because that's the way the bifurcating intellect works. Otherwise, it can't choose, you know, it's like this and that. Bifurcating, two making, dualistic consciousness. You have to make it into two before you can decide, you know, like do this or that, right or wrong. It's the right thing about school. Right answer, wrong answer. So the mind thinks like that, and that's its job. It's good for that. That's like the main obstacle to what we're talking so about So becoming here. aware of that is part of getting to know yourself better or understanding how the mind works and its limitations. So you know that you realize you can't think your way out of some of these conundrums. Like it's fine to think about whether you're in love or not, and you know, and, and who you, you know, uh, what is love and all. But the mind can only go so far with that. You have to practice it, experience it, experiment, fail, whatever you want to call it. Win, lose, listen to country western sobbing songs, you know, whatever. One more question. Experience then? it. You have to rock it. You have to get into the fray, not just with the mind, but with your body and soul, heart and mind, you know, energy, psyche and spirit, meaning totally. So if the spiritual lo life or, or love story, if you want to call it like love story in terms of love of truth, love of God, the spiritual love story, you have to get into a body and soul, heart and mind, energy, psyche, and spirit, and probably with others. The mind can't, whatever you said, rebalance all of these dualisms. The mind is the producer of dualisms, but there's more to us than the mind. There's also the intuition, there's the senses, you know, I don't know. Is, 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 is hearing dualistic or is it conscious hearing, you know, auditory consciousness that makes those discriminations? In just hearing, there's no um, dualism. It's the mind, it's the consciousness, the dualistic consciousness that projects these distinctions. It's, either, it's always or never, you know. It must be either a wave or a particle. Uh. That went on for so long until some brilliant person, maybe they read a Buddhist book that talked about the four corner logic. <laughs> about is, is not, both, and neither. And they said, holy crap, these goddamn little buggers, <laughs> I'm talking about electrons, I think, sometimes they behave like waves and sometimes like particles. Sometimes they exhibit the characteristics of both. And mother, foe, sometimes they exhibit characteristics of neither. Wow. So it's not just two choices, there's four choices there for the mind to get busy oh. on, which, you know, like, Two plus two, you know, it's kind of like four squared. You're, suddenly you have a lot of choices, meaning maybe there's other ways to experience it or to parse it or to use it or to measure it or to describe and understand it. But then there's experiencing and realizing. So it's, let's not get stuck with the intellectual understanding and intellectual information yeah, but how level. Do you, how do you do that? Because like, so We're I, trying I, to do that here. There are maybe other ways. But the mind, the, the, my question, my last question, then I'll let it go. Go like, ahead. I want to stop using my mind for all this, but it, it won't stop. Right. It seems to be powered by... So be aware by, of your mind, that's how. Awareness what's of mind. What's powering it? What's driving it? It doesn't feel like it's, it's me the anymore. Famous, it's the famous, um, I forget what it's called, infinite energy, inexhaustible energy machine that everybody's been seeking. What's powering it? Karma, that's what they say. From beginningless time, karma, habit, you know, if you want to call it evolution, that's a fine word. It takes it beyond the individual. Well, it's not me. I can sense that now. Like, so, I'm not responsible for all my thoughts. I used to think so I was. So that's a big realization. You mean they're not just your thoughts? No, they're not. They're your parents' thoughts, your grandparents' know. thoughts, their human thoughts, their guy thoughts, which may be different than girl thoughts. You know, whose thoughts are they? So are we like a radio picking up channels then? Is that like what it is? Like, I mean, no, I'm being serious. It's like the human system, like, like we think we're the generator of this stuff, but we're not. Like, That's we're right. Not, the, we're not they, generating any of it. I don't it. know about the radio now. We're not generating everything. It's all happening. That's hard. To but we follow. think we're, we're doing it all, and we think we're the boss. Thus, surrendering to the creator who's doing it all is one interesting and effective strategy for some people. Surrendering to karma is one interesting and effective strategy, or being one with karma for some people. 
Not knowing is an effective strategy also, rather than thinking we know and we're directing the show. Then all of a sudden you get a big surprise and so disappointed and freaked out. How could that happen? Bad things happen to good people. How, why? How? Nobody can, can explain. I'm fucked. <laughs> I'm depressed. I kill myself. I must, it's my fault. So I, it's a good insight, Tim, about, so I'm, I'm not producing the thoughts. That's true. You so that in well, well I'd say who's the I in that? You know, because if you do certain things, you might produce some, certain thoughts and not others. You know, we also have to make a little more nuanced thinking if we're going to get into that. Like, maybe I'm not producing them consciously, but I'm producing them semi-consciously, or subconsciously, mm. unconsciously, etc. So it doesn't mean you're not necessarily responsible for them. Like I don't know. If you get drunk and you start to have, uh, I don't know what, uninhibited thoughts, you have sort of produced uninhibited thoughts. So it's not either or. I'm producing it all becomes I'm not doing, I don't, you know, I'm not, I have no agency. I might as well just die. I'm like no different than a stone. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying be like a stone. Be like a living Buddha, not a stone Buddha sitting in the garden inert. No. So I hope this is helpful. Thank you. So awareness of thinking and uh, you know, mindful of mind is the way. That's how we do it here. There may be other ways. Questions? Yes, hi. Hi, Lama Surya. Hi. My name is Christine. Christine. Um, I've been attending sessions that you've had in um, New York City, and I've never introduced myself, so I thought it was feeling kind of weird. Introduction <laughs> is very important. I'm glad that you finally got it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, this is my first um, retreat. and um, How's it going? It's sweet. Good. It's not hard? Seven days of no. awesome monastic no. silence, no. celibacy, teetotaling, no. vegetarian, and nothing but lettuce in your salad? <laughs> I mean, locally grown, organic, no doubt. It is. No, it's it's going too fast, actually. Yeah, right. Um, a silly question. You mentioned Brooklyn. Um, if one is originally from Brooklyn, does one get extra credits on the yes, path? Yes, of course. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I really don't have anything else. I just wanted to thank you because I never got a chance. Thank your you. Thanks teachings, for coming. all those years and years of your meditation, we benefit, and um, and your writings are really beautiful. So I just wanted thank to you. say thank you, and to everybody else here because it's it's great. Thank you, Christine. I'm sure my mother and father, but more my mother, is very very glad to hear this very important, you know, gratifying, like sort of hymn to Brooklyn-ness. because <laughs> she knows where it all comes from and where it's all at. She's glad to tell us. My late mother, I should add, but she's still, you know, very much involved. <laughs> it seems. <laughs> and my father, and all of my relatives. Marsha. Um, I feel like I've had just a, a sort of da ah uh, moment this morning. Um, after, because <coughs> I've, unlike the last person who spoke. I've been listening and coming for a long time, and I'm kind of slow, but... That's because you're not from Brooklyn. I know. I don't, have the, I don't get the extra credit. You know, it's, it's something that lasts, sort of the action, the stabilization, tempe. Tub. Is that sometimes Tub. translated like as emanating or... No, or it's, it's translated as obtaining, obtaining. the stability, not emanating. But go on. Because I realize that I've, I've been thinking about it, particularly with stabilizing in the way I think about it in English as a place you get to, and then it's stable, right. and the, it's all figured out. And I, I just sort of got this morning that it's roiling around, that last stage, the action, the... the <coughs> yes, it, it's It's flow. not a place you it's get to, stasis. and it's done. It, right. It's sort of almost like there should be like a big, you know, arrows going round and round there, because it's not, it's not done. It's yes. just... I don't know if there should be arrows going around and around. Well, that's it's way more like my the, life goes, but it, I know. it feels in and out. The flow and, of the Tao isn't usually imagined as so... I don't know, what, that sounds a little like getting stuck inside a washing machine. 
The it, flow of the DAO is usually imaged a little differently, but however you want to experience it, there is a continuity. But let me go yeah. back to what came out of my mouth today, which I don't think I ever said before about this. I really haven't talked much about these three, the fourth um, triad there. Occasionally, in advanced retreats maybe. Stabilizing means stabilizing what? Now it's too easy to say stabilizing Rigpa. That's what many would say, that's fine. But I said this morning, I mean, I heard myself like thinking aloud. It means stabilizing the ground, the groundless ground from which one can never deviate. Then there's no path to fall from, there's no falling. There is a rival, but it's not a fixed place, but you see, it's the ground. You're always on the ground when you when The groundless, you yeah, there's, no, all, there's, nowhere else there's to no other, there's nowhere else to be. Thus, the notion of that king of sky dancer can stand in emptiness, can dance in the sky. No problem, no fear of falling, nothing, no dualism. What does falling mean in deep space? There's nothing to hit. There's no other. There's no planet. There's no ego. There's no heaven and hell, good and bad. And it helps me to think she's up there dancing, like the interpretive yes. dance question. Yes. It's not it's stable a joyous. like... Buddha it's like a flame. Yeah. A flame might look stable, and you want a flame to be stable, like your, I don't know what, your pilot light and your boiler or stove. But a flame is a living, dancing thing, if you look at it even a little closely, not even with an electron microscope, right? And heat, the heat is rising and rushing. and So again, the flow of the Tao, or the steady state of a flame, like energy... Energy is alive and moving, but it's a steady state in a certain way of understanding or imaging it inside. That helps a lot. I hope so. Thank you. So that's the arrival point, but it's not a, st a static arrival point. And, you know, if you say, then you'll have it all figured out. That's just, again, back to the mental way of thinking. What We need to figure it all out, then we'll be all fine. Always. No problem. No, the mind is fickle, and you know, even not just our mind, your mind, my silly mind, Tim's silly mind, but science is fickle. It figures things out all the time, and then it changes. It proves things all the time, and then it changes. It's an interesting metaphor, really, for the limits of the mind and rational, and our idea of what final or truth is. It's very hard to argue with those truths when science proves them until it shifts suddenly every few years or decades. Very interesting. And humbling. So I'm not here saying that religious truths are any better. Maybe they're the same in terms of changeable. I don't know. Yeah, it's humbling. Back to the mystery. Not just we, should, we have to become omniscient. I'm not a fan of seeing that word in Buddhist books. It's not what Buddha meant. Our idea of that is not what Buddha meant. It's like Buddha is omniscient. He knows what he need, all he needs to know. And maybe even further, he knows all he needs to know to help liberate the unliberated. That's what, he's, that's what Buddha's all-knowingness means. So I don't know if that means having it all figured out. Like Buddha, even Buddha himself. And if you read traditional books, in translation, of course, Omniscience might be mentioned as one of the qualities of Buddha, just like if you read about God in books, it might say in some all-knowing or cosmic consciousness or everything, this kind of, you know, over-idealization, but um, for the faithful, let's say. Even Buddha himself, the historical figure, we have a lot of records from that time. People memorized stuff and went over it again and again and checked. So we didn't have tape recorders, but people memorized stuff and got together and checked the memories and compared memorization. It was a very, you know, Indian society was very developed in those days, like Chinese society at that time, much more than European, not to mention in the American societies. Buddha had 14 questions that he famously would not answer. You can Google it, look it up. One of them is uh, like, um, does the Buddha exist or not exist after death? I mean, does the enlightened one? Do you? They asked him. Do you, the enlightened one, exist or not exist after death? He took the Fifth Amendment, if that's the right way of putting it. He abstained from answering. He said, not conducive to the enlightenment that I teach. 
to speculate about that. Is there a God or not? He said, not that's not my subject, not conducive to the enlightenment that I teach, to speculate about that. He didn't say there was no God. That's why Buddha is known as an agnostic, not an atheist. So even Buddha had 14 questions he didn't answer. So I don't know, did he have it all figured out? Where did the world come from and begin? They asked him. That's one of the 14 questions he would not answer. He said, not conducive to the enlightenment that I teach. So but in Tibetan Buddhism, we actually have an interesting answer to that, which I'll just like bring out since I'm kind of just channeling and I can hear my Tibetan master saying, oh, now's an opportunity to mention something interesting that Tibetan Buddhism teaches. So some centuries later, you know, a master or somebody was teaching or came upon this, I don't know, writing, thinking, whatever they did in those days, and come upon new ways of expressing the, the timeless dharma, the old wine and new bottles, just like today, continuing in that direction. Where did it all come from? Remember, when they say the world, they mean it all, the universe, all the realms of being, visible and invisible, not just earth, not just humans. The Tibetan Buddhist teachings say, Buddha said, it all began, it begin, began or begins, it's not clear how you want to put it, in ignorance, in not knowing, and it ends in enlightenment. It's beginningless cycle of dualism or ignorance or not knowing, or kind of like blind evolution, and it ends in like The ultimate evolution, the culmination from that. I don't want to put words on it, enlightenment, whatever that means. And at the same time, then they give the other side of it, being middle wayists, Madhyamikists. And another way of saying it is there's no beginning. It's beginningless. I think I'm getting this wrong. Let me try again. It's beginningless. Samsara is beginningless, the cycle of ignorance and conditioning, but it ends in enlightenment, freedom from conditioning. So it's beginningless but has an end, and the complementary way of explaining it, rather than beginningless, is it begins in ignorance, it begins in that mistake of, that's why it's not just began, it begins in that mistake and misperception in the moment, and it never ends once that starts. So that's like a little Tibetan Buddhism for you, titillate the, the mind. So even, you know, Buddha didn't have it all figured out in the way that we think things should be, could be, or might be figured out. Last question. Anybody have a burner and blazer? Anybody slower to the draw? Anybody we haven't heard from? We heard from her yesterday. Anybody we haven't heard from who's slower to the draw? <clears throat> okay. Hi. Well, is it because I'm not from Brooklyn that you don't want to hear from me? Yes, that's exactly why. <laughs> don't hold it against me. <laughs> okay. Where are you from? I'm from Montana. So I just had a We question. don't mind. <laughs> We're very tolerant. Uh, okay. So where is there room for contemplation in yeah. the whole scheme of That's a good question. View, what do you mean by contemplation? Um, I guess positive thought, thinking about you know, all these sort of concepts that one should think about and sort of contemplate on, right. why we're here, that sort of thing. Yes, good question. You know, a lot of these words depend on how you define them. What is meditation? What is contemplation? What is mindfulness? What is awareness? Same, different, etc. So you gave your definition about thinking about these things. And the place for thinking about these things and questioning and investigation is more in the study and the other analytical kind of aspects of our in inquiry and our path, not while we're practicing sky gazing, to be precise as to what we're doing here. That doesn't mean never to think about them. As I mentioned the other day in Buddha's seven factors of enlightenment or seven ingredients of his recipe for enlightenment, that questioning and inquiry was one of them. Mindfulness is one of them, but there's other things. Questioning and inquiry is one of them. Balance and flexibility is one of them. So, in general, everybody would say study and practice go together like the wings of a bird with the two hands. So in the study part, 
more thinking and analyzing and memorizing, contemplating, debating, pairing, comparing. And in the practice, it's so more or less a left brain, rational, thinking, analytical, and then cognitive. And then in the practice part, more, maybe not entirely, but more right brain, intuitive, holistic, all at once, in the moment, experiential, intuitive. That makes sense to you? So study and practice. And study doesn't just mean square like reading books. Also studying ourselves, studying our mind, our body, or studying relationships, studying, you know, opening the book of nature, not just reading science about organic chemistry and biodynamic farming. Study and practice go together. If we just talk, emphasize practice, and haven't learned how to practice, study. If we haven't learned how to practice, then our practice might not be very effective. I'm not going to talk about right or wrong. Just not that effective. A little learning can go a long way. So learning and then application. So, um, and also there are, it, now let, let's jump to just straight Buddhist talk. There's many different kinds of meditation. One of them is called analytical meditation. So, even in that kind of a thing. It's not really study, but you're using the analytical faculties to think about things. Like, um, not just popping the question and letting go who is experiencing my experience, but analytically going through, deconstructing the hut that ego built. It's an analytical meditation of self-inquiry, looking into, am I my body, am I my mind, if I'm my mind, what am I, am I my thoughts, am I my feelings? What about when I'm a dream? Who am I? What am I? What about in a coma? What about in, in death, after death, in death? I don't know. What about when I stop breathing but I'm still alive for a few minutes? What about if I'm in frozen water for 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes and not breathing but still alive? Who am I then? Science has shown that there can be people who are alive after five minutes and not breathing in frozen water and stuff like that. Who am I then? I'm not thinking. I'm not conscious. It would be hard to say the unconscious is active. I don't know if there are brain waves. I haven't studied this neurodharma that much. See what I'm saying? So that's called analytical meditation. So we could say this is a Tibetan Buddhist meditation tradition analysis, that there's two kinds of meditation, the more analytical, where you're using the mind to work it, that's like thinking about things, contemplating them, to use your words, and then there's just the meditation, which is more like placement, where you just place the mind on an object, not think about that object, like the candle flame, concentrate on the candle flame, concentrate on the mantra, concentrate on the visualization, not analyze it. So study and practice in general, an analytical meditation time as distinct from just leaving the mind, resting the mind meditation time would be another time to be thinking and contemplating in your sense, like considering these questions. But of course, these are existential questions that we've been talking about that come up in our life for many, if not most people. So. Any time's a good time to think about them, to contemplate them and ponder them and chew on them. Thank you. And be a more thoughtful and discriminating, um, maybe perhaps even deeper person, not just a thoughtless, undiscriminating, simplistic person. Thus, we're not anti-intellectual by any means. Try to follow, uh, what did he call it there? The middle way, that's it. <laughs> Balancing mind and heart. Now, of course, we're so in our society, educated and brought up to put so much about the mind, not to mention the body and senses, but the mind education. So maybe in the meditation and yoga traditions in the West, we emphasize, overemphasize, try to emphasize more experiential, non-mental practice and development just for balance, since we go to school for 20 years, 
Maybe we haven't spent that much time with the other thing, but the two go well together. My old friend Ramdas, we were at Maharaji's ashram together in the early 70s. He has always been nagging us Buddhist teachers, Western Buddhist teachers, which is kind of his uh, domain, to uh, make the journey from the head to the heart and to not talk about mind so much, but to include the heart. So there's a place for both, but let's not get stuck in either. They're not separate anyway. But uh, as Westerners, you know, these days, all we hear about is mindfulness, mind training, mind science. In Buddhism, it, it, the word is mind-heart. It's a hyphenated word, citta, like bodhicitta. It's not here, it's not here. It's, a, it's our whole consciousness, including unconscious, etc.